Okay, I see one, C two. Okay, Council, you're up. Thank you. Uh, my name is Desiree Banish. I'm here on behalf of the appellant, Linda Commons. Um, may it please the court. This, court. this case arose from the lower court's denial of a charging lien that was filed by Ms. Commons because she had not been paid uh, her attorney's fees. The, um, the amount of attorney's fees that's in controversy here is $88,600. Uh, the remainder of the fees had been paid as a result of a prior settlement. The entire settlement was um, $1,055,500. And that occurred in two different settlements. Uh, the, first, uh, the first check went to Mr. Price's trust account and he dispersed uh, those fees to Ms. Commons uh, appropriately. Uh, then the second check was supposed to go to Ms. Commons trust account, <clears throat> but um, Mr. Price arranged with defense counsel and beknownst to Ms. Commons to have that, that settlement check sent to his trust account uh, for the purpose of that money being in his possession. There were three hearings on this matter. There was a case management conference and a motion to compel. And during both of those, Mr. Price was claiming an hypothecation uh, as his right to <clears throat> a portion of Ms. Commons' fees. By the evidentiary hearing that was noticed by Ms. Commons, uh, he filed a response a day and a half before the hearing, changing his theory of the case to a retaining lien. Uh, Mr. Spracklin had been subpoenaed to come to the hearing, and once there, upon the prompting of Mr. Price, Mr. Spracklin claimed attorney-client privilege and refused to testify and refused to allow documents to be entered into evidence to prove up the, uh, the charging lien. Ms. Manish, yes. uh, it seems to me that there are two conflicting, inconsistent theories in the case, one by your side, one by the other. Your side is you're asserting a charging lien on property of the client. That's correct. And Mr. Price's side is asserting a charging lien, I mean, a, a, re, a retaining lien on your property. Correct. So it seems to me. On property. Oh, uh, yeah, on your side's property. It seems to me that if, if this case is going to be resolved on this issue, one of the things we have to decide in the court is who owned the property in Mr. Price's trust account. That is correct. That is the, the crux of the entire case. Now, uh, let, me, let me ask another question, though. Yes. Has your client sued, um, I don't recall the fellow's name, you're, you're the personal injury client? Mr. Spracklin. Mr. Spracklin, rather. Have, has, has your client sued Mr. Spracklin for, for fee? No. The, the case law has... Uh, stated that it is better for the fee issues to be resolved in the case uh, so that, you know, confidentialities can be maintained. Well, of course, uh, so far that hasn't happened. Well, she did assert a charging lien, and that's why we were here. Your client, uh, charging lien aside, it's not necessarily inconsistent with the charging lien for your client to sue Mr. Spracklin for her fee, Correct. Correct. She can, do, she can do so. Uh, I guess that will depend on the outcome of, of this case. The, uh, the issue of who owns it uh, seems to revolve around the, of who, of when paid is paid. The lower court held that because Mr. Spracklin signed a settlement statement allocating the fees 
reference to Miss Commons that Mr. Spracklin paid her fees. But decades of case law conflicts with that, saying that paid isn't paid until legal tender is transferred and all rights of the previous possessor have been extinguished. Once a check is delivered, the person that wrote the check could um, stop payment or somehow withdraw that. Uh, so it's once the check has cleared, then payment is made. There was no payment. There was a check for $61,000 and change that was sent to Ms. Commons by Mr. Price, who is the fiduciary trustee in this matter, responsible for paying Mr. Spratlin's legal bills. He's the one that has asserted a retaining lien. Ms. Brandish, can I circle back to what Judge Northcutt was asking earlier? Yes. Procedurally before the court, I mean, we understand that both sides are making claim for this money. And my understanding of the, of the fact, this was set for an evidentiary hearing before the court to say, hey, we have this dispute, help us out. And am I correct that at the evidentiary hearing, you had the opportunity to call, you know, Mr. Spracklin. That, I'm looking at the transcript. There was really no evidentiary hearing conducted in terms of taking testimony or, or putting him under oath saying, you know, that this is my fee. Do you have any problems with the fee? Nothing like that. I think it was only legal argument. The court afterwards made some comments that said, yeah, your client probably is entitled to that, but based on the record before me, came to the conclusion that she was not, that the, the judge was not able to do it at that juncture. So having said all that, up here on appeal, when we review the court below, when we see you had, a, you, there was a, re, there was an evidentiary hearing, but there's no evidence presented. Help us out here, Ms. Brown. <laughs> Okay, and you're, you are correct in that, and it was one of the issues that have been brought up in the briefs, in that uh, we tried to have an evidentiary hearing, but the um, Mr. Spracklin, upon the prompting of Mr. Price, said that uh, he was not waiving his attorney-client privilege against his attorney. They, I mean, it, it didn't make much sense. Uh, but uh, the court went with that, and then the court kind of took it away from evidentiary hearing and said that uh, she believed that she could decide this as a matter of law. Uh, she did put Mr. Price under oath, and he testified as to what Mr. Spracklin, who was right there, uh, was thinking. Uh, instead of Mr. Price, I mean, instead of Mr. Spracklin testifying to it, Mr. Price told uh, told us what uh, was going on with Mr. in Mr. Spracklin's mind. Uh, we were not given an opportunity to cross examine um, or really put on any evidence. She just ruled as a matter of law, and that's why we've claimed that this is uh, the standard of review here is de novo. Um, it was claimed that the ministerial act of signing a settlement statement equals payment, and that was the reasoning behind the court's finding that there was no charging lien because uh, Mr. Spracklin had not avoided payment, and that was based upon argument slash testimony of Mr. Price. It was it was rather confusing as because the court was asking Mr. Price questions under oath, but also allowing him to argue. And so it's confusing as to what was testimony and what was argument. Um, 
I would say that there are several reasons why there is a charging lien and why there is not a retaining lien. Um, first of all, the, the court rather passively granted a retaining lien to Mr. Price, even though she admittedly didn't have jurisdiction to do so. Um, a settlement statement is not payment. A settlement statement is a direction to the fiduciary to pay someone's bills according to how it is delineated in a settlement statement. Uh, it doesn't become the property of Ms. Commons upon his signing so that Mr. Price then has possession of Ms. Commons fees to assert a alleged retaining lien for an alleged bill that um, Ms. Commons feels she does not owe at all. Um, a bill that was sent to her over a year after the alleged work was done and it, he attended one hearing and gave a bill of $35,000 discounted to 27 uh, and said nothing about it until he asserted this hypothecation and then when he couldn't meet the elements of a hypothecation changed it to a retaining lien just before the evidentiary hearing. So we had uh, prepared for the hearing for a hypothecation argument and got a totally different one and uh, a client that was complaint uh, that was claiming attorney client privilege to avoid testifying it it's clear that there that Mr. Spracklin because part of the argument was that Mr. Spracklin is out of this he's innocent he has no part in it but when he came to that hearing and refused to testify against his, uh, uh, I mean, as a neutral person with two attorneys, but to, took sides, he was an active participant in uh, avoiding payment to Ms. Commons in favor of Mr. Price. That satisfies the element of a charging lien. Um, the partial payment that Mr. Price sent to Ms. Commons for, uh, I believe, 61000 because he's complaining, I mean, he's claiming uh, $27,000 he is owed, was, uh, had, had a note on it that this was her fees for this case. It doesn't say partial payment or anything like that. So Ms. Commons, couldn't cash that check. So in in so she's asking that uh, she be given uh, that the lower court that this case be remanded uh, for um, to also determine what is the interest that's owed on the entire amount. Now it's true that Mr. Price has said that accord that uh, he would not assert accord and satisfaction in this case. But he has also filed a case against Ms. Commons in Miami. And it is clear that he is going to uh, claim accord and satisfaction in the Miami case should she uh, cash that partial check. So she, was, so she has been deprived of the entire amount uh, for quite a while now. Um, Mr. Price, it, it, this was also a paycheck, and a paycheck is treated differently. Uh, a, for a paycheck to be intercepted between an employer and an employee, that must go through a garnishment action, and here there was no such thing that he took her paycheck uh, and didn't go through any of any of the proceedings. And it matters how 
it, it matters how he came into possession of the funds to establish a retaining lien. It's not an acquiring lien, it's a retaining lien. And Mr. Price manipulated the situation to obtain those funds in his trust account, whereas it was supposed to go into Ms. Common's trust account. And he did that for the purpose of being in possession of her fees so that he could claim it. Uh, Mr. Price had a conflict of interest. He was wearing two hats that the lower court uh, in the first two hearings had a problem with. She had a problem with him wearing two hats, the hats that is looking after uh, Mr. Price and Mr. Price's firm's best interest and the hat of the fiduciary that is supposed to distribute the funds on behalf of his client, Mr. Spracklin. Mr. Bannish, Ms. Bannish, I'm sorry, uh, you didn't mention whether you wanted to reserve rebuttal time. You are down to five minutes and use them as you please. I, I will take the rest for rebuttal. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Mr. Grossman, you're up. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Dennis Grossman of the Law Office of Mr. Price, uh, appearing on behalf of appellee James Spracklin. First, I just want to address Mrs. Ms. Banish's claim that uh, there was no evidentiary hearing and no opportunity for uh, Ms. Commons to put in evidence. That's, that's just not true. Um, at page, on record page 318, which is transcript page 15, the judge, after swearing in Mr. Price and after hearing Mr. Price's testimony, the judge turned to Ms. Banish and said, well, I'm now giving you guys, uh, speaking to Ms. Banish and to Ms. Commons, I'm now giving you guys an opportunity to put in whatever evidence you want. They had subpoenaed uh, the plaintiff, Mr. Spracklin, to appear. He appeared pursuant to the subpoena. He offered some attorney-client objections to specific emails the specific documents he asserted an attorney-client privilege. He never said, nor did Mr. Price ever say that he's not going to testify totally. They just never called him as a witness. They had full opportunity to do so. They never did. They had full opportunity to put Ms. Commons on the stand and never did. Um, if but did Mr. At, did Mr. Price testify that he was holding the funds on behalf of Ms. Commons and not Mr. Spreckland? Yes, that was exactly Mr. Price's testimony. Is, and that's the... Is, is his version of that binding? It should be because there's no contrary evidence. Well, I'm not, I'm not, not sure it's an evidentiary question. We know uh, beyond knowing that the funds came into him as part of, a, of settlement proceeds uh, for Mr. Spreckland's case. Uh, and that um, Mr. Spracklin owed fees to his attorneys, including Ms. Common. Um, I'm not sure that Mr. Price's view that he was holding it on behalf of Ms. Commons and not on behalf of Mr. Spracklin is really legally correct. Well, uh, it, it's the only evidence there. The burden here lies upon the movement, upon Ms. Commons, who is asserting a charging lien it's her burden to prove her case that a charging lien existed. I went over the transcript again last night. After the judge told Ms. Banish and Ms. Commons that she is letting, in the judge's words, you guys put on whatever evidence you want, Ms. Banish, at that, after that point, Ms. Banish spoke no less than 20 times on the record of the hearing, not once did Ms. Banish call Ms. Commons as a witness. After the judge told Ms. Banish, you guys now have an opportunity to put in your evidence, Ms. Commons, the appellant herself, spoke five times on the record. Not once did she say, judge, I'd like to be sworn in and testify that those funds were not mine. 
the funds clearly, and the movement in this commons has not proved otherwise, it's her burden of proof. The funds clearly in Mr. Price's trust account where that's disputed $27,000 was clearly Miss Commons property. Once Mr. Spracklin signed the closing statement, the settlement statement, once he signed that, it was Mr. Price's obligation to treat it as Miss Commons property. That's the nature of a settlement statement. Or was it his obligation to Mr. Spracklin to pay the fee that Mr. Spracklin owed to Miss Banish? It, no, it was his obligation to treat it as Miss Commons property. And your your authority for that is? Basically, the nature of a settlement statement. It's the nature of a settlement statement that it's Miss Commons' property. There's no doubt that it was Miss Commons' property once Mr. Spracklin signed the closing statement saying, this is the money I owe to, to, um, to Miss Commons. If Mr. Price had not treated it. So if Ms. Banish sues Mr. Spracklin, I mean, Ms. Commons sues Mr. Spracklin saying, I haven't been paid my fee. He will say, oh, I need to third party Mr. Price because Ms. Ban uh, Ms. Commons' fee is in his possession and he won't pay it. Well, but that's an issue that's going to be resolved in the already pending action that Mr. Price has commenced in circuit court. It was transferred to county court. Did he submit, did, okay, did Mr. Spracklin sue Mr. Price? No, Mr. Any? Price sued Mr. Price sued Mr. Miss Commons. Uh, she has filed a pending motion, I believe, to dismiss. Uh, if, assuming that's going to be denied, I'm informed that it has not been resolved yet. Miss uh, Commons has an opportunity to counterclaim against Ms. Pri Mr. Price. And Mr. Price, indeed, he made a motion in this court, in the trial court, in this case, to deposit the $27,000 into court. He said, look, I want the court to control this money. I don't want to run off with this $27,000 if ultimately it is determined by some court that I'm not entitled to it. Mr. Price says, I'm entitled to this. I've asserted a retaining lien against it. The Monas case in the Florida Supreme Court supports my retaining lien. But if it turns out that I'm wrong, I don't want to be accused of any wrongdoing. Please, court, accept this deposit into court. That motion for Mr. Price to deposit the disputed $27,000 into the circuit court, in this case, was denied by the circuit judge. She said she had no jurisdiction over it. That's a matter between Mr. Price and Ms. Commons that's going to be resolved in the already pending lawsuit in Miami-Dade County, commenced by Mr. Price against Ms. Commons. Mr. Price can go there and deposit the money into court. Mr. Price has committed that he'll be more than happy to deposit the money into court. That, has, that hasn't gotten Mr. Spracklin's obligation to Ms. Commons paid, though, correct? But, but it will if the court determines that uh, Ms. Commons is owed the money. Mr. Price submits that, with all due respect, that she's not owed the money. That's why he asserted the retaining lien. But if, it, if a court determines that Mr. Price is not owed the money based upon arguments between Ms. Commons and Mr. Price, Mr. Price would love to be able to deposit that money into court. And as I mentioned, he tried to do so in this case itself, but it was denied. And, and Ms. if Mr. Grossman, Mr. Grossman, if, if I may, Mr. Grossman, because it, be, it becomes a little, I'm sorry, can you hear me? It becomes yes. a, little, a little confusing. We can't hear you very well, Judge Kessler. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, did ahead. I jump in? I apologize. I did. If you have a question, I'll wait, Judge Council. No, no, go ahead. Okay. You're farther along than I am. Okay. I guess where the confusion comes up, Mr. Grossman, in this lawsuit, the lawsuit that's, that is now on appeal before us, the matter was set for evidence hearing before the court. And as I understand it, is, is, is Ms. Branish was trying to say, that her client is entitled to that money because she had earned that money in this case. 
And as as I understand, your client, Mr. Price, basically saying, yeah, she's entitled to that money. However, she owes me money on another matter. And I don't want to disperse all this to her because I'm entitled to get paid on some other case that she owes me. That's the problem that I'm, I guess I'm having a problem with. If there's no dispute that her client is entitled to receive her attorney's fees representing Mr. Price's client, Mr. Stratton, isn't she entitled to receiving that? She's entitled to that money subject to the retaining lien, which Mr. Price properly asserted pursuant to the Florida Supreme Court's decision in the Monis case, which both sides have cited. The Monis case is directly on point. We're well, let's talk attorney. about Monis for a moment, if we might. Is Mr. Price's contention is that Ms. Commons was his client or was the client the person he entered into court a notice of appearance for? Mr. Mr. Pr Mr. Price was the attorney assisting Miss Commons in the unrelated case. It was the Chapman case. They were representing uh, where, Chapman? Uh, Miss, Miss Commons was representing uh, Mr. Chapman and Mr. Price was representing and assisting Miss Commons in that case. So and, he's saying that Miss Commons was his client? Miss Miss Commons now, under Monus, it has to be a client. So the answer right. is yes, that yes. she's his client. Yeah, yes. In the Chapman case, Mr. that strike you as a bit of a stretch that co-counsel has the other counsel as a client. Well, no, that that can often happen. I mean, it might not happen. It might happen, but that's exactly the type of issue that's going to be decided by the Miami-Dade Circuit Court upon Mr. Price's assertion of a retaining lien. Judge Casanueva, you've addressed issues which are pertinent to the existence of a retaining lien. I understand your question. Twice on the record, um, and I'll cite you specifically, um, on transcript page 15, that's record page 317, Ms. Banish said, that the issue, all issues of a retaining lien are for another court. She was referring obviously to the Miami date action pending between Mr. Price and Ms. Commons. Again, on transcript page 31 at record page 321, Ms. Ms. Banish says the retaining lien is not with, retaining lien issues are not within the jurisdiction of this court. And the judge, in this case, agreed with Ms. Banish. And the judge in her order stated, this court has no jurisdiction over all these retaining lien issues, exactly as Ms. Banish argued. So Ms. Banish pre prevailed on that issue that all these retaining lien issues, which Mr. Price has asserted, and about which your honor, Judge Casanueva has inquired just a few minutes ago, all these retaining lien issues are not within the circuit court. Then the circuit judge agreed with Ms. Banish on that. They will be resolved in the Miami-Dade circuit court. As to the charging lien issue, which is within the jurisdiction of the circuit court in this case, clearly once, once Mr. Spratlin signed the closing statement, the settlement statement, committing Mr. Price to treat that as Ms. Commons' property. Mr. Price then went ahead and asserted a, ret a retaining lien, the validity of which by Ms. Banish's own argument is not within the jurisdiction of this court in this case. The circuit court agreed with Ms. Banish, that issue is going to be resolved by the Miami-Dade Circuit Court and Mr. Price will be more than happy to deposit that money into any court which will agree to accept the deposit to secure Ms. Commons' claim should she prevail against Mr. Price. As so, to Ms. Banish's so Mr. Grossman, argument. If, if yes. I may, Mr. Grossman, because I'm pulling up and then the transcript, didn't the court at one point said, and I quote, it seems to me that 
if she is owed a fee for this case, I rule on that and she gets her fee from this case. So the judge acknowledged that she's entitled to her fee. Then there's that argument of that tangential other case, other case that Mr. Price is claiming that he's owed on. And so then there was a mishmash. There was no, it's, it, it should have been clearer at, at, in an evidentiary setting to put Mr. Mr. Price under oath, to ask him a question about, uh, there's no question, I guess what I'm trying to say, that she is owed a fee in this case. And the big dispute, mm -hmm. Are, are, are we clear on that? A absolutely. Miss Miss Commons earned that fee. That was her money in the, this present case. Absolutely clear. No dispute about that. And because it was her money, Mr. Price then asserted the retaining lien. As to your honor's inquiry regarding the clarity of the evidentiary hearing, it was clearly an evidentiary hearing. She she swore Mr. Price in as a witness. He just didn't argue as a counsel. He swore and he testified under penalty of perjury. The judge expressly stated on the record to Miss Spanish that, quote, I'm going to let you guys, quote unquote, put in your evidence now. Miss Spanish thereafter spoke 20 times on the record, never calling uh, Miss, Miss Commons as a witness, never cross-examining Mr. Price. Miss, uh, excuse me, Miss Banish spoke 20 times. Miss Commons spoke five times, never saying, judge, swear me as a, as a witness. Miss Banish, on behalf of Miss Commons, never called the client, Mr. Spracklin, as a witness. Mr. Spracklin asserted attorney-client privilege regarding a couple documents, but he never said he was going to refuse to testify. He was there. He was ready to testify pursuant to subpoena. He was never called as a witness. Mr. Grossman, let me it. ask you something on a slightly different matter, if I might. Um, in examining the copy of the complaint filed in Miami, that's in our court file, so I acknowledge that it may be dated or superseded. Count one is for a breach of contract. Count two is for quantum merit. Count three is for open account. There is no count to foreclose a, a retaining lien on any corpus of funds. So without such a pleading, how does the court in Miami address it? The court, the court, the court addresses it on the merits and whatever way the does court it decides. Are the merits de deferred by, determined by the corners of the pleadings? Yeah, but the pleadings aren't finished. The, the, so I'm case, asking right now, there is nothing about foreclosing a retaining lien on a corpus of funds. So under you have represented, it will be taken care of in Miami. And I'm looking at the counts that appear and I'm wondering how it's going to be done based on the present status, uh, the record that was before this trial court. And there's nothing in there that I could see about a retaining lien. If there is a requirement to foreclose on a retaining lien, I'm sure Mr. Price uh, will seek to amend his complaint. Um, I, I note that that Miami-Dade action is in its early stages. I believe an amended complaint was filed. Um, and in the early stages of the case, uh, I'm sure Mr. Price will amend the, the complaint in whatever way is necessary if there is a technical procedural uh, deficiency in that complaint. Um, and given the liberality of amendments... Oh. As, I understand. I just want to make sure I follow the argument that there was something in this complaint that the trial judge had before at the time this case was resolved, that somehow it might resolve the question of a retaining lien. And I guess what I understand is that if it doesn't, you're prepared to make sure it does. Yes, ex exactly. And, and at the early stages, again, uh, Ms. I understand. Commons, I great understand. liberality. Great liberality. I was a trial judge for seven years. I remember that argument. All right. I, I understand. Um, as to Miss Banish's argument that uh, she could not, uh, that Miss Commons could not cash the $61,000 check, that's just totally baseless. Mr. Price has consistently stated, and he even submitted a proposed order to the trial judge in this case, 
that Ms. Cummins can deposit that check without prejudice. She wants to raise whatever arguments she wants to raise. There won't be any accord and satisfaction anywhere. It's totally without prejudice to her rights. But what Ms. Cummins is trying to do is she's trying to hold back, claiming she can't deposit that $61,000 check, which she in fact can without prejudice, because she's seeking to use that as a basis for her treble damage civil theft action. Ms. Commons, and it's in the record, has served Mr. Price with a letter giving him alleged notice of a prospective um, civil theft treble damage action in which Ms. Commons seeks to treble not $27,000, the disputed sum, but rather she seeks to treble $88,000. Uh, and she is purposely going out of her way not to deposit the $61,000 check, which she can without prejudice. Mr. Price mentioned that in his emails and proposed order in the trial court. He's mentioned that uh, in his answer brief in this court. I am again reiterating uh, that commitment that Ms. Bannett, excuse me, that Ms. Commons can deposit that $61,000 check without prejudice to whatever arguments she wants to make with regard to the $27,000. So uh, again, um, through all the retaining lien issues, which uh, Your Honor, Ms. Uh, Judge Casanueva, which you mentioned regarding retaining lien are not before this court. They are not, um, the, the trial judge has no jurisdiction. Ms. Banish twice argued that in the transcript. The trial judge agreed with Ms. Banish. All those issues are gonna be decided in the Miami-Dade court. The charging lien, Ms. Uh, Ms. Commons failed to satisfy her burden. She had an opportunity to testify. She made arguments. There was absolutely no evidence whatsoever, none whatsoever. Okay, uh, Mr. Grossman, I thought you were starting to wind up because your 20 minutes are up and you seem to start, you, you seem to be cranking right. up again. So I'm going to. In, in, in conclusion, there is not only uh, more than enough competent substantial evidence to support the trial judge's decision. That's the only evidence in the record. It supports the trial judge's decision. This court should affirm in all respects. Okay. Thank you. All right, Ms. Banish, you have five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Um, I would like to first address Mr. Grossman's statements that um, Mr. Price has stated over and over that Miss um, Commons would not be in fear of accord and satisfaction. It, it, it is clear in the record uh, that he said that she would not be uh, held to accord and satisfaction in this case, in this charging lien case, in this case that is styled uh, for Mr. Spracklin. He specifically did not include the Miami case, which is where accord and satisfaction would be most important. If he went down there and said, oh, well, she's already cashed a check that says that this was her fee, she's accepted that and she has waived uh, her right to the other 27,000. Uh, since he would not, and he'd been given many opportunities to stipulate that it would not be in accord and satisfaction as well in, in the Miami case, he has refused to do so. Um, Mr. Spracklin, uh, I, I'm fairly sure that he was put under oath and I began questioning him and uh, it, he immediately claimed uh, attorney-client privilege. Uh, then the court took over the questioning, asking him if he was uh, going to waive his attorney-client privilege. He said no, and that effectively ended the evidence that I was planning on putting in uh, to show that he had instructed Mr. Price to pay Ms. Commons her fees and that he owed the fees that she, you know, laid the foundation for the whole thing by, by uh, having him testify that she, he hired her, he did work, she did work, there was a settlement, all the things that you have to show to show that, that uh, Ms. Commons had a right to a charging lien. 
uh, none of that came in through Mr. Spracklin. It was all spoken to either in argument or testimony from Mr. Price, who was the one saying that Mr. Spracklin didn't have a dog in the fight, actually. Uh, but it didn't seem that way because there's no reason for Mr. Spracklin to refuse to uh, testify that uh, Ms. Commons was uh, his attorney, that she got a settlement for him and that she's owed fees and that he has instructed his uh, fiduciary to pay those fees. Uh, yet he wouldn't do that because ostensibly he's helping uh, Mr. Price. Mr. Spracklin stopped communicating at all with Ms. Commons when this whole issue arose. Um, about the evidentiary hearing, the court took over saying that she could decide this as a matter of law. When she said that, that ended the evidentiary portion. Um, it's her courtroom. She can do what she wants, but uh, I, that uh, basically ended it. Uh, the pending action in Miami, the amended complaint has not even been served. That case hasn't gone forward at all. Uh, Tony, there was even a, if there is an amended complaint, is it in our record? Um, it's not in our record. I don't know that we need to talk about it. It, it was in the reply brief because as a response to something in the uh, responsive brief. Uh, that's that's the only thing. So there. it was not before the trial court. Uh, no, at that at that time it was not. Uh, Got about half a minute, Miss Banish. Okay, uh, I. I would just like to reiterate that uh, Ms. Commons is entitled to be paid. There's a strong public policy that uh, attorneys are to be paid from the fruits of their labor. That takes precedence over a retaining lien. It predates uh, how when a retaining lien could have been uh, aro arisen. And uh, we ask that the case be remanded for uh, to reinstate the, re, uh, the charging lien and for determination of interest on the entire amount. Okay, thank you both very much. Uh, to leave our, our virtual courtroom, there is a leave button on the Zoom screen. And if you click that, you will go away. Thank you very much. Thank you.